Thank you all for joining us. If you have listened to Radio Atlantic, the Atlantic's flagship Thank podcast you. before, then you know that we always kick it off with a glorious rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was recorded by John Batiste. Battle Hymn of the Republic, written by Julia Ward Howe, published in the Atlantic, first published in the Atlantic in 1862. So we consider it our theme song. And the one and only John Batiste recorded this fantastic rendition. Kevin, kick it off. This is Radio Atlantic. All right, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. And thank you once again for coming. I am Matt Thompson, the executive editor of The Atlantic. To my left is Julia Yaffe, the Atlantic staff writer. <laughs> Covers politics, international intrigue, and foreign policy. To Julia's left is Elliot Cohen. <laughs> Atlantic contributing editor, Johns Hopkins University professor and author of The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force. And, of course, to Elliot's left is my esteemed co-host, Jeffrey Goldberg. The Atlantic's editor-in-chief. Jeff, what are, we, what are we talking about again today? Canada? Is it? Uh, the NFL. Are we doing the NFL today? NFL? Take uh, it. I don't want to do anything controversial, so we're just going to stick to Russia. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about Russia today, and we're going to talk about uh, Donald Trump's relationship to Russia, and we're going to talk about what Russia wants, and we're going to talk about the world and America's place in the world, and we're going to do it in like eight minutes. It's going to be fantastic. Sound good? Um, so I'm going to jump right in because there's no point in waiting. Um, and I, I want to go to Elliot. If, if, Elliot, could you set the stage for us? Could you talk for a minute or two about what Russia is to us, adversary, enemy, competitor? And take us back a few years. Take us back to, to Obama administration and, and, and walk us forward before we get into the, 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 the crises of the moment. Well, I think in some ways you have to go back even a little bit further than that to the Bush administration uh, and to a, a sense that emerged in Russia that this was going to be a conflictual relationship. I would describe Russia as, as adversaries. It got deeper and deeper for a number of reasons. Uh, part of it, Putin's reaction to the Obama administration, to uh, Libya. Uh, part of it to a misreading, I think, of Western policy. The, the Russians been quite convinced that we've been trying to instigate the so-called color revolutions in Eastern Europe. And that, of course, is a threat to the Russian regime. Uh, but I also think part of this is this is Putin, great Russian nationalist, reasserting uh, Russian power. There's a whole bunch of mixed motives. But I would say fundamentally this. This is an advers fundamentally an adversarial relationship with some elements of cooperation here and there. And it's not going to get any better. Well, we can just go home now. That's great. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for bringing it way down. Julia, just uh, do something for us that's, that's actually very important in a, uh, a fact-driven discourse. Tell us what we know for sure about the relationship between Donald Trump, the Trump administration, and Russia, and what we don't actually know. Well, there's a lot we don't actually know, and I think that's important to keep in mind as we... Um, often wax hysterical at the latest breaking news that um, this or that has been uncovered and proving collusion or not. Uh, we actually have not proven that, and there's a lot we don't know. So um, what do we know? We know that the Russian government interfered in our elections, that they bought ads on Facebook. We know that um, they hacked the DNC servers, actually that they hacked them twice, but didn't know about the other 
one hacking party didn't know about the other hacking party. We know they also hacked the servers of the DCCC, the uh, Committee to Elect Democrats to the House of Representatives. We know that they then weaponized that information through um, friendly intermediaries like WikiLeaks, which has, we learned in 2016, going, went from essentially a radical pro-transparency organization, as controversial as it was, to essentially a wing of Russian intelligence. Uh, we also know that a lot of, that the Russians employed armies of bots and trolls and commenters to kind of um, colonize and make hostile the, the, the conversation around some very touchy issues. They were kind of the bellows of the 2016 election. What we don't know, though, is actually how it was done. We don't know a lot of the mechanics. We don't know how closely coordinated it was, how looped in Vladimir Putin was, for example, to all the details. We don't know how, to what extent, if at all, it was coordinated with the Trump campaign. So you, we know, for example, that Roger Stone, who was a kind of on and, on and off, on again, off again advisor to uh, Trump, was bragging about his connections to WikiLeaks and predicting uh, email dumps in the fall. But to what extent was it, you know, did Trump know about it, right? So it's we're getting down to who knew what when, right? right. What, is his, what is Donald Trump's seeming inability or unwillingness to criticize Vladimir Putin? What does it mean? And maybe, Elliot, you can jump in on that, too. I think I, we don't know what We it risk means. over-interpreting it in a yeah. kind of way. I, I actually think it's not... Um, I think we often do over-interpret it. I think, uh, for example, okay, so we, we don't know, for example, there was a dossier... Uh, compiled by a former British intelligence officer uh, for essentially paying clients. And there were a lot of salacious um, allegations in it, including the existence of blackmail of a tape that would, could make the president of the United States blackmailable. But I don't think you need that to explain his relationship, um, Trump's posture toward Putin, the fact that he won't say anything critical about him. I think that he, I think that the president has a very adolescent um, idea of masculinity and power, and Putin embodies that. Do we, no, we don't agree with that? Okay. Um, I that is think just, that, just analysis. That's just analysis. That's uh, all it you is. You know, it's, and, and um, it's the reason, for example, that Vladimir Putin like, and Ramzan Kadyrov, the head of Chechnya, like uh, Mike Tyson or Steven Seagal. It's, again, it's that same idea of what masculinity and Because they're stuck in the early 90s, among <laughs> other things, yeah. Hi. Right, and the track pants. And also, and, um, and I think that Trump, I think to this day, believes that Putin uh, called him a genius, which he did not. But, you know, you try telling Donald Trump that he, Putin didn't call you a genius. He called him yarki, which means like a um, kind of bright in the sense of like colorful. Um, it, could, it could cut. It's kind of, it was kind of a backhanded compliment, actually. But Trump said he called me a genius and he said very nice things about me. I think he likes him. And uh, he likes that somebody who is that powerful flatters him. And um, he's also stubborn. And I mean, look at how he, how he responded when he was asked over and over again to criticize his supporters, the kind of alt-right at Charlottesville. He just will not do it. He's stubborn. I'd, I'd add a couple of things to that. First, in terms of some of the circumstantial things we know, we, we do know that there are a lot of people who are associated with Trump quite closely who have had shady relations with Russia. We know that his son said that there was Russian money in the Trump organization, particularly after 2008. We know um, that he goes really crazy when people talk about a Russian connection. So there's, there's all that that's circumstantial. I think there's, there, in addition to all the things that Julia said, which I agree with, there's another <clears throat> aspect to this. He, Donald Trump does not have a foreign policy doctrine. But, but he does have a certain approach. And I think his view, and you, you hear this a bit from Steve Bannon, is, okay, with the Chinese, it's trade war. With North Korea, it may be war war. Uh, with Iran, it'll be another kind of conflict. We're going to go kill jihadis all over the place. And, you know, his, he doesn't particularly care about human rights or anything like that in Russia. And he figures, why not do a deal there? Because, you know, I've got all these other people I'm going to be taking on. 
So there's, there's a, there is a kind of crude foreign policy logic to it as I, well. I do want to just jump in and add one more thing. I think he, uh, Donald Trump's admiration for Vladimir Putin is not singular. He has expressed similar admiration for Pre President Xi of China, Erdogan of Turkey, Duterte of the Philippines. I mean, he has a type. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and it's not just overseas. You know, it's, I've always been struck that he, re, he has referred to Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis as Mad Dog Mattis. Right. I've spent a lot of time with the American military, including visiting with General Mattis in Iraq um, when he had 1st Marine Division. I have never heard anybody in uniform call him Mad Dog. And if you know Mattis... It's from Mattis, a Steven Seagal film. What? <laughs> if, if you know Mattis, he, I mean, he is a very tough guy. He is not a Mad Dog. He's the furthest thing from it. This is an extremely well-read, thoughtful deliberate kind of guy. Um, and the fact that that, that you know, tr Trump would be excited by that, it is the juvenile side and of he him. loves generals, and he loves right. getting in trucks, and he loves, you know, and going on <laughs> ships and uniforms. It's well, I love getting in trucks, too, but that doesn't make <laughs> well, me authoritarian. Well, I love going on ships, too. And that, yeah, but he like, you know, hey, maybe it's, it's a guy thing. It's okay. often widely assumed so, that the president's uh, praise for Putin is... Uh, some indicates some sort of tighter relationship between the two of them. But is that true? I mean, is, wouldn't it be that if the president were, if the leader of Russia did have untoward influence with the president, that he would be, they would be warning him against signaling? Right, Donald Trump, would be, it would be too obvious, his behavior. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you would want to play this in a more sophisticated way. Is that, is that fair? Well, but, I mean, this goes to the question of are we overreading and overinterpreting stuff that might be very simple to understand, this well, kind he, of affection he, for authoritarianism. Yeah, well, he also, um, you know, he's also been told repeatedly, including on the news and by his, you know, his... Uh, intelligence community that the Russians tried to help him win the election. I, I mean, if I were him, I'd like that too. So I, I don't know. But that's one of the things we don't know. We don't know if there's a tape. We don't know if there's a tighter relationship. I, I actually just did a piece um, about how he was not able to build anything in Russia despite 30 years of trying to build something in Russia when everybody and their mother built something in Russia in terms <laughs> of like hotel, hotel chains. Um, but he wasn't able to because he didn't have the right connections in Russia. I, for the record, have never built anything in Russia. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you know, the, the other point to bear in mind here is American-Russian policy is actually not made simply by Donald Trump. One of the things that's so striking about watching this administration is how extraordinarily incoherent it is. You know, if you talk to the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, Russia is a kind of a malevolent actor. We've got to beef up our forces in, uh, in Europe. Mattis, I think, certainly feels that way. You know, we've got a special envoy to Ukraine, uh, Kurt Volker, who is pretty hard on Russia. So, you know, the, the institutions are pursuing one policy, and Trump, in his kind of erratic, blustering way, is pursuing a different policy. Right. But, th but that's, that also speaks to Putin and the Russians and the extent to which they don't understand how the American political system worked. Which what don't they get? Uh, that Donald Trump doesn't just make the policy in the, in the U.S. Uh, I remember Are they mirror imaging? Putin is in charge well, of everything, I mean, therefore exactly. Donald Trump must be in charge I, exactly. of everything? Exactly. I think Russians and Americans are more similar than we'd like to admit. And uh, because we all come from large countries with um, imperial ha pasts and this idea of a kind of divine mission, uh, we tend to think that everything in the rest of the world works just like it works in America. You know, that... Um, democracies function the same way. Russians think that we bribe traffic cops the same way they bribe traffic cops. They don't, they just, it, and it's at every level. So um, I think, for example, Vladimir Putin and the guys around him who came out of the KGB and the FSB, they're conspiracy theorists par excellence. So they did not think Trump was going to win. They thought that it was all sewn up for Hillary Clinton because of the, you know, cabal of the establishment and George Soros and... Um, we have a very yeah. ineffective establishment, obviously. Yeah. But so, so, so for again. example, when the, when the second START treaty was negotiated during the Obama administration, uh, the Kremlin was very angry when Obama said, okay, now we have to take it to Congress. And they were like, what? 
what, I mean, we, we just did this, and we also have a Congress, you know, get it done. <laughs> so they, they, they just, they don't, they think it's very similar. And so I wish they, you could see the scare quotes in a podcast. <laughs> it's going to be hard. But yeah. Yeah. I, quote, unquote, Congress, yeah. I, I, think I guess we now have a quote, unquote, Congress. Uh, I have a somewhat different angle on this. I think Putin, and I, I think to some extent they're baffled by this, uh, as we are baffled by them. I also think there is an element of personal contempt for Trump. Uh, and you can tell me, Julia, if I'm reading too much into this. I was very struck why Putin at one point says, he's not my bride and I'm not his husband. Okay, sexist, I get it. Yeah, but uh, the gender assignment the, was not The accidental. gender assignment was not accidental. Right. For a guy who, you know, goes around hunting with crossbows and riding on some Siberian tigers and stuff like that. Um, and I think also the other thing about Putin as a former KGB officer he has, I think, quite keenly what Trump sort of has, which is a feral instinct for weakness. And I think they can judge Trump's weaknesses. They know his vanity. Um, but Well, if you come out of an intelligence agency, that's what you're trained to do. You're trained to look for the spot, the weak spot, right, in, well, in the, in the yeah, target. Certain, kind, certain kinds of case, case officers do all kinds of things. Right. But a certain kind of case officer goes right for the weak points. And... Putin's a case officer. Uh, and, and more than uh, just being a case officer, before he was an intelligence offer, officer and a pretty middling one at that, he also came from the mean streets of Leningrad, post-war Leningrad, yeah. which was wrecked by the war. He didn't really have a father. He was a street urchin. And uh, street urchins have a good sense for weakness and power dynamics. And, you know, he basically grew up on the, you know, uh, right. the streets. They, uh, I think they do have a... At this point, they're very displeased with Trump and with how things have turned out. Um, this makes me think of when Mike Hayden, former... Well, what, did, what do they want him to do? Well, they wanted to reset everything. Uh, there was a great report in BuzzFeed, actually, about how they, the Russians delivered this memo to the, to the State Department and were like, okay, let's fix everything. Let's be friends. Let's just have an immediate reset right now, right away. And, of course, it went nowhere because the very establishment, the foreign policy national security establishment, that's so uh, suspicious of and loathes Russia so much that the Russians were trying to circumvent has now tied his hands. So the, what you're seeing on Russian state media, which is this kind of reflection of what's coming out of the Kremlin, is Trump is weak, his hands are tied, he is uh, Gulliver t tied down by the Lilliputians. Mm. I, I think they would also at this point, I'm not, I don't know that they ever thought that there was a grand deal to be done uh, because I suspect that they're contempt for Trump is, is of long standing. But I think they would like to screw us up. Um, and it seems to me there's plenty of evidence for that. And to the extent that you can turn Americans on one another and get them fighting each other over stupid stuff uh, and call into question the legitimacy of their elections and you can expose the sham that is American democracy in their eyes, all good, all good, even if there isn't a deal to be had with Trump. One of the things that I've been wondering a lot about is how sophisticated was the interference in the election? I feel like I hear two stories, each of which could be, either of which could be plausible. One, that this was a bunch of black hat kitties throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and looking into a really effective cyber attack on the U.S. election. And the other, that this was an ingeniously masterminded scheme puppeteered by Putin himself that uh, laser targeted several American precincts and had an uh, impact on the election of unprecedented scope. And which of those stories is true? Probably neither, I, w I would think. I mean, uh I would say first, a, a, um, an operation of this scale and significance going right at American political processes had to have been approved by Putin. So they, they would not, you know, the king didn't know. He, he for sure knew. Part of the Russian uh, intelligence style, as with some other intelligence agencies, is you try lots of stuff. And you, you try lots of people. You use and the, the meeting that they had with, uh, Jared, with Jared and uh, was it Don Jr., was very typical. You use a cutout to a cutout to a cutout, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, that, you know, that, it's a, that's classic sort of KGB style. Try lots of stuff, and if something works, it works. If it doesn't work and they shout, so they shout, and who cares? 
And there's also the, the problem with figuring out to, you know, where on the spectrum this actually lay um, is the fact that the Russians always build plausible deniability into these kinds of operations like they did, for example, with the annexation of Crimea or the invasion of eastern Ukraine. You had a bunch of guys there who were all just on, vaca on vacation, you know, and just fighting during their vacation time, right? Uh, and, uh, and, of course, and of course, then it turned out with some digging that they were active duty military officers who actually were technically on vacation but were forced to sign off that they were going on leave, da da da. So you have, for example, here you have hackers who um, probably were not, again, we don't know this 100%. Uh, somebody knows this, but it's probably highly classified. Um, most likely what happened is that a lot of these hackers were not, you know, GRU officers with epaulets sitting in a basement somewhere and clacking away at a keyboard. It's probably mercenaries who will hack for the highest bidder, uh, people who have run afoul of the law, which in Russia is pretty much everybody, and that you can blackmail into working for you. And then you can say, well, I don't know who that guy is. And a lot of times you don't know who that guy is. Like I mentioned, there were Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear went into the DNC servers and Fancy Bear didn't know that Cozy Bear was there, and Cozy Bear didn't know that Fancy Bear was there. Like Elliot said, you're trying lots of different things. As for whether Vladimir Putin closely coordinated, coordinated this, that's unlikely given his management style and the kind of Russian management style. The way he operates is he kind of gives a signal. Um, it could have even been as slight as that Hillary really don't like her, wouldn't like to see her be president. You know, it could have been very vague. And then everybody below him starts scurrying and uh, interpreting that signal and trying to please his or her immediate boss. And it kind of trickles down this giant bureaucratic um, pyramid that's also an octopus, if you can imagine. <laughs> Doesn't the version of that happen when the president tweets here in the U.S.? <laughs> the pyramid octopus so operation? The pyramid octopus no, no, I mean, bureaucracy it's, 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 yeah. but, By the way... But um, because it's a pyramid, one tentacle doesn't know what the other tentacle is doing because it's not a head, it's a pyramid. Okay, I'll stop. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is harder on a podcast, obviously, than, than in a magazine. Uh, by the way, just, you so, you know, just so you know, um, uh, behind his back, we call Matt Fancy Bear, just so you know that. That's, that's also his nickname. The, um, I like that nickname. The, um, so we, let me switch a little bit here and, and talk about what hasn't happened yet. Uh, because one of the remarkable aspects, and you've written about this in The Atlantic, uh, a lot of people have talked about this, one of the remarkable things about the first 252 days or whatever it is of the Trump administration that we've just experienced um, is that nothing cataclysmic has happened in the world. We're getting closer That's and closer. That's a pretty to low bar, don't you well, think? No, 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 but wait, let me, let me explain what I mean. Uh, in, in other words, we're getting closer and closer with North Korea, and I want to come to that for, uh, in, in a minute, but uh, the wounds and the dramas and the catastrophes of the Trump administration so far are mainly self-inflicted, Twitter-inflicted, et cetera, uh, personnel inflicted. So the question is, um, so the question is, if uh, Vladimir Putin decides that, you know, um, he really wants all of Moldova which is not in NATO, wants all of Moldova back in his reconstituted Russian empire and makes the same sort of moves that he made in Ukraine, how does this administration, this administration you described as incoherent in its foreign policy making and defense policy making, how does it respond? And then let's take it up one further level to, uh, to a threat against a NATO ally, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. What if, what if he, as we know that they have designs on these countries, they belong back in the fold. So what do you think, the, I'm asking you to speculate a little bit, what would the reaction be within this administration? Trump's instincts, you're suggesting, would be totally diametrically opposite the instincts of some of the generals who we, who we see around him. Well, first thing to say, you, you, you just can't tell because Trump is Trump. And, and it's a mistake to think that any of his personal relationships are anything other than completely transactional. If, if Trump, if Putin does something to harm him, tomorrow morning, Trump, uh, Putin will be a monster. But that's the question. It does, does, does Trump consider that an affront to, to America? To, if, 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 if it somehow becomes an affront to his dignity or to him, his sense of who he is, uh, then yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll lash out. I mean, he, look, He'll lash out at disabled people. He'll lash out at war heroes. He'll lash out at all kinds of people you wouldn't expect him to. The, on what could happen, I mean, I'll tell you what my worry is. Uh, I think for the Russians, 
for Putin in particular, but not just Putin, the big issue is this. They can live with the end of the Cold War for sure. They can live with the end of the Warsaw Pact. They can even, to some extent, live with the end of the Soviet Union, although I haven't met many Russians who don't think the Ukraine is part of, uh, part of Russia. What they have a lot of trouble living with is the legitimacy of a North Atlantic Treaty Organization that continues to exist. And it seems to me that the, I mean, yes, there'll be stuff in places like Moldova, but, but the big issue will be is if there's some sort of attack of a somewhat ambiguous kind, say on one of the Baltic states, that state invokes Article 5, an attack against one is an attack against all, and there isn't a decisive response of some sort, that's it for NATO, and that's it for the pillar of post-World War II American foreign policy. By the way, the issue is not just us. The last poll that I saw of German public opinion on this was, you know, 70% of the German population saying they didn't think Germany should be willing to use force to support one of the Baltic states in the event of a Russian attack. That's, that's a big problem. What would actually happen, I don't know. For sure... How does a president not trigger Article... But respond to an automatic triggering of Article 5? Look, when he, when he went to Brussels to dedicate this monument, uh, the 9-11 monument, which, is, by the way, that's the one time Article 5 has been invoked. It was invoked by the Europeans to support us after 9-11. He very deliberately, apparently, deleted from his speech a reference to Article 5, which had been put in there by the folks on the NSC staff. And that's very troubling. So things like that kind of obviate the need for Putin to go into the Baltics or into Moldova. I think the other factor here is that um, just like in the in election interference that we saw, they're very flexible and they don't need everything. You know, this is, they, they, Apparently the term for this is escalate to de-escalate, right? They start with a maximalist position and then they're happy to take, you know, 15% if that's what they can get. So they don't need to take Moldova, incorporating Moldova or even uh, the eastern two provinces in eastern Ukraine is very expensive as they learned with Crimea. They're better off having frozen conflicts there which therefore make them technically ineligible to join NATO because you cannot join NATO if you have a territorial dispute within your borders. So now Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova cannot join NATO. Mission accomplished. You don't need to actually invade yeah. them. The Baltics, um, because of all the public hemming and hawing that we've done, um, including reporting that has shown that, you know, People in the Pentagon are like, well, you know, we don't need to fight to win. You know, what is what is uh, Article Five stipulate anyway? It doesn't mean that we have to we have to defend them. It doesn't mean we have to win. So we can just uh, send in some troops eventually into the Baltics and bog the Russians down, and there will be a frozen conflict in the Baltics. But we will have fulfilled technically our Article Five uh, obligations. So you don't, you know, if you hear that, if you're Moscow, you don't need to invade them anymore. It's one thing um, you know, that has to be borne in mind in the, is the context of Russian military reform and increased Russian defense spending since 2008, when, yes, they defeated the Georgians, but they paid a much higher price than by all any reason they should have. Uh, they've spent a lot more money on their military. They've engaged in some very interesting reforms. Russian defense industry is not quite back to where it was under the Soviets, but they produce some pretty good kit. Um, and if you look, for example, at the Baltic uh, Sea, what you can see is that actually it would be a little bit difficult for NATO to operate there. They've got some very sophisticated uh, surface-to-air missiles, uh, which makes it difficult for aircraft to operate over there. They've got anti-ship cruise missiles, land-based, which make it difficult, could make it difficult for ships to operate. So the military challenge is non-trivial. The one other thing, though, I'd also say is, important to bear in mind, they've got a lot of problems, you know. Their economy has not been doing particularly well. It is based on extractive, it's an extractive economy, so oil and minerals and stuff like that. Their demography, demographic profile, profile continues Their to go Their bank system the is collapsing as we speak. Yeah. So um, I mean, they are not up for a really big war, although they do periodically work themselves into a lather about that possibility. In just a minute, right after this question, I'd like to pause for a couple of questions from the audience. So if 
two people, exactly two people. One would go to this mic over here, and one would come <laughs> to this mic over here, here. We will call on you for a questions in a moment. But I wanted to ask you about a prediction uh, that uh, uh, made a couple of years ago. Back in May of 2014, our own David Frum reviewed a book by Ben Judah. And he writes, Judah advances two predictions, both borne out by the early phases of the Crimea crisis. So long as Putin remains power, Russia can never evolve into a normal state. Anything resembling the rule of law would put an end to the organized looting that has so fabulously enriched Putin and his inner circle. At the same time, Putin cannot afford to push his confrontation with the West to an outright breach. His entourage of bureaucrats and oligarchs has stashed tens of billions of dollars of ill-gotten gains in Western investments and bank accounts where the fortunes could be traced and sequestered if the United States government were ever sufficiently provoked. That's the dilemma of the political crook. He can store money where it's protected against adverse effects at events at home or where it's beyond the reach of the U.S. Treasury Department, but not both. Putin leads a brutal regime, but also a vulnerable state. What do you think of that prediction three years hence? I think it's pretty much true. Uh, the only thing is that a state that is um, that weak internally and when uh, that is led by a leader who has you know, in 2012 returned to power clearly legitimately, even when you're trying to maintain a facade of Western-style democracy, you have to earn your legitimacy in other ways. And so, you know, if you watch Russian state TV now, you don't see anything about what's happening in Russia. You only see things, uh, you know, about the Russian commandos in Syria. You see about, you see news about North Korea, about how badly we're doing. You don't see anything about what's happening domestically. And so what does that tell you? You're going to, and the other thing is there's the rally around the flag effect. Uh, that's very important. The Crimean annexation gave Putin a giant bump in his ratings and the Kremlin is addicted to ratings, uh, to poll numbers rather. And, um, Ratings, poll numbers. Poll numbers. They're, they're addicted to polling, and they see it as a kind of democracy, like this weird micromanaged thing. Mm. Um, and it gave a huge boost of legitimacy and popularity to other organs of the state, which have historically been unpopular. That effect is wearing off right now. Putin is up for re-election a fourth time in March of 2018. So what I would expect to see is another, either Russia insinuating itself into a crisis like North Korea even further, or lashing out in a way that rallies people around the flag and delivers him a resounding victory in March of 2018. I, I think, you know, even if, uh, let's say, Putin gets eaten by some Siberian saber-toothed tiger that he's chasing around with a Bowie knife, um, we'd still have a serious problem. I mean, I think that his replacement is likely to have a lot of the same attitude. Some of these are quite deeply rooted in Russia. And, you know, if you know something about Russian history, there are... There are deep veins of Russian nationalist thought that he is tapping, and so those won't go away. Second thing I would say is part of what we have to worry about is not, and, and I think this is Julia's point, um, it, is not just that he'll wake up one day and in a very coolly calculated way say, today is the day to drive to Berlin. Uh, I don't think that will, is likely at all, but that there'll be a series of stupid things and miscalculations, and you stumble into crisis. And, you know, I'm, a, since I'm basically an historian, I've got a profound belief in human stupidity. And, and I think what's, that is, that is entirely conceivable. And it is even more likely, because of all the other stuff that's going on in the world, where you'll have a United States that's distracted both by its domestic politics, but also stuff that's going around all over the globe. There'll be a lot of factors interacting with one another. So I think it's important as we think about Russia that you don't simply uh, uh, isolate the Russia problem from all the other stuff that's happening. Questions from the crowd. Hello. Thank you for being here. Um, you, you've asked a good, a good question about uh, how sophisticated the Russian operation was. So my question is to Julia, uh, who traveled the country extensively during the election and um, knows what was happening and uh, how the electorate was reacting to uh, all the rumors swirling about the candidates. A lot of tropes about Hillary Clinton, um, I assume they were a result of Russian propaganda. Is that so? And if it is, then why are such a large portion of the American population proved to be so receptive to the Russian propaganda? I should also stipulate that that's my cousin. <laughs> and I had no idea that he would be here. So. 
Hello. <laughs> um, it's friends and family night here at Radio Atlanta. <laughs> so, I for one was um, surprised to talk to a former Bernie, then Jill Stein voter in Kent, Ohio, um, who came out to hear Bernie stump for Hillary talk about how Hillary surely had Parkinson's, but she seemed to manage it really well with a lot of medications because she didn't have tremors. But knowing the medications and having seen other people with Parkinson's, they would have made her a zombie, but she, was, she seemed quite sharp, so we don't know how she did it. But she definitely had Parkinson's. <laughs> and, um, so, and, and this person had gotten this information off of RT. Russia Today, uh, and didn't care that it was Kremlin sponsored. I think when it comes to this, you know, like that story landed on very fertile ground because Hillary Clinton has dealt with about 30 years of almost entirely negative press in a certain segment of the, you know, political segment of the population. So that falls on very fertile ground. You tell them, Hillary, you know, I had a, another. Donald Trump supporter tell me that Hillary Clinton went to witchcraft conventions that, and that she was a witch. And I had to then ask him, you know, do you know of any spells that Hillary Clinton has cast? Um, and then I figured, you know, that she's lost the election. But um, so I think that, the, you know, the Russians didn't build the proverbial fire. They didn't put the logs there. They, they didn't set them on fire. They were the bellows, um, you know, exacerbating social tensions, and I think a lot of that is on us, and how well educated our readers are in terms, and our, how we consume media, and, and how critically, and um, how much we allow ourselves to be manipulated in this way. So I, I mean, I go to magic conventions, so I wouldn't be all that surprised by somebody going to witch conventions. Um, you go to magic conventions? Yeah. The combined a separate show. Weird, I didn't yeah. see you there. I didn't see you there. Some 1,200 didn't, didn't magicians in Louisville, Kentucky that. this summer. Quite a sight. It's a perfectly entertaining pasta. Yeah. All right. Um, look, I think, I, I, I would put it more forcefully. She was a terrible presidential candidate. She managed to she lose that one. Was she worse than Trump? What? Was she worse than Trump as a presidential candidate? I, would I prefer to have her as president? Sure. She was obviously a worse presidential candidate because she lost. She would have been a better president. But she's a terrible politician. She's really a terrible politician. But wait, you don't, you don't think that, that the, the lies, lies, actual lies, coming from overseas sources did what Julia said? A lot I mean, of them I'm, weren't I'm, coming I'm, from I'm, overseas I'm, sources. I think absent that. I'm, I'm, I'm open. But like Benghazi was not a Russian creation. You know, they didn't make Jason Chaffetz and Trey Gowdy run investigation after investigation on Benghazi. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll be open. And to, cover it on Fox News every night. I'll be open to the evidence. They also... You know, the Russians didn't make her do something which, when I was at the State Department, would have gotten me fired, stripped my clearances, and handed over to the FBI for prosecution. Look, we'll never actually, all these counterfactual, we'll never know the true calibration yeah. of this. Well, we, we, may, we may learn more. I, I, mean, I, I think that. I think I mean, we're I, heading that's, toward that's a why point. I say it's important to be open minded. I'm Jim Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, said something recently where he indicated that he thought that it, it might have had an effect. I, I, am, I will be open to the evidence, but my, I, from the very beginning, quite apart from, and before any of this Russian stuff came out, you know, I was saying to friends of mine, not that I thought Trump would win, but that I thought it was a serious possibility, both because of her weaknesses as a candidate and because of all the other stuff that had been happening in the country, and because Trump do, does have that feral instinct for weakness and vulnerability, and he played to a lot of those. So I think... Uh, it, it would be a mistake, I'd say, to say this was an election that was stolen by the Russians. Or I don't think so. I mean, there's enough other bad stuff the Russians have done, like murdering people and, you know. Yeah, a lot of this is on us. Yeah. Stay tuned for what what happened by Elliot Cohen uh -huh. coming in February. What happened? Right? <laughs> yeah. What also happened? So, given that Russia has effectively been able to attack the U.S. and would be able to do a similar attack on other Western-style democracies. I don't feel like we've seen much of an effective international response to this. Has there been an international response to the Russian-U.S. interplay? And can there be an effective international response to this? So, so the first thing I think it's important for us to acknowledge, not that I think this is true, the way the Russians think about this, and you can see it in the writings of the chief of the general staff 
and other military experts is they think that they're only doing to us in an inferior way what we did to them, particularly in the Ukraine. That's how they read it, that we are the ones who are the sinister, incredibly clever manipulators of domestic politics with you know, our so-called free press and our non-governmental organizations and Goldberg and Thompson and all of them, that that's, they really believe that. And I think one has to take that, one has to take that seriously. You know, the French, I think, and the Germans were both very alert to Russian interference in their elections. It will be interesting to go a little bit more deeply into why we got the result we got in Germany just now, where the right-wing party did much better than I think people expected. And again, the explanation may be purely in internal German politics. It would also not surprise me if there's an element of, of Russian interference. You know, the, the, I think the, the best cleansing agent, as is usually the case, is sunlight. And the more, the, the more quickly and the more thoroughly you expose this, you cover it, you demonstrate it, the more you inoculate yourself against it. I will say that the, the Russians, by the way, have already warned their citizens to be alert for American interference in their upcoming presidential oh, elections. On. On. And they're about to kick Facebook out of their country, which I think oh. is pretty funny. <laughs> You're very, very dark. <laughs> All right, take one I, more question. Okay, I, it, this has been a fantastic panel, by the way, and I, I want to thank you. This thank is you. really good thank stuff. And I, and, um, so I'm a lawyer, and I hadn't read a book um, for like 40 years because I've been busy reading legal stuff. And I got started reading, and the first book I read was a definitive biography of Putin, written by the Moscow bureau chief. You're probably familiar with him. I can't remember his last Stephen name. Stephen Lee Myers. Right. His thesis is far different from you guys' thesis. And with all due respect, I think he proves it out. His thesis is, is that Putin is the single most effective politician of the century. That his ability to withstand opponents and to, and to you know, persevere, that his manipulation of Medvedev and Yeltsin before him, that his um, ability to survive, you know, with oligarchs, that his murders, repeated murders, you know, of, of, of politicians, journalists, lawyers, that he, he's a much scarier figure than, and, and I submit to you respectfully, that I just don't buy that he misunderstands America. I think he understands America's politics better than we do. So, and I certainly understand it better than, than Trump and, and the people around him. And I think those fair, there's Facebook bots um, show you that, you know, that the Russians bought, show you that they understand, you know, the Muslim thing, the immigration thing, the, the tension between the, uh, the red states and the immigration issue. These are people that are very, very, very sophisticated, the Russians. So, Julia, what do you think of the mastermind theory? So, Stephen Lee Myers is a phenomenal journalist, was a phenomenal Russia correspondent, and his book is fantastic. I don't think that the two, um, I don't think they're, these ideas are in opposition to each other. I think Putin is incredibly wily, effective, and plays consistently plays a weak hand very strongly. He is, um, and we saw this again in the election interference, he's nimble, he's flexible, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't get something here, he z zigs, he zags, he's, um, that's what gives him strength. But what you also have to keep in mind is that he has built a state that is entirely dependent on him uh, living and breathing. And unfortunately, uh, he is mortal and he will die one day and it's unclear what happens afterwards. That means he's not a de facto a strong leader if it's all if it all hinges on him. And everything that he has done is to maintain that power for another year, another two years, another three years. And that's again, it's um it's a projection of strength rather than a core strength. I, I think you I mean you haven't heard anybody say that he's not capable. I certainly think that he's capable. But uh, first, there are other books about Putin. I wouldn't go just on the basis of reading one book. You might want to read Fiona Hill's book about Putin, which makes it clear that he is a complicated guy. Absolutely. But, you know, it's important to remember what uh, the British politician Enoch Powell once said, all political careers end in failure. His career will end in failure, too. And whether it be through overreach or whatever it'll be, it, it will be. I mean, all the people we're talking to, 
Donald Trump has political talents. There's no question in my mind about that. Um, but, but I also think you've got to be wary of the, you know, master spy, you know, the marionette handler who's pulling so, all the so strings. So you don't buy, um, gonna, you don't buy Malcolm? I don't fully yeah, buy Malcolm. I've got to throw out oh, one more question from our uh, third co-host, Alex Wagner, who could not be here with us tonight, but sends this. She says, there's been a lot of talk that the relationship our president may have had with unknown, unnamed Russian oligarchs who may have been looking to clean their assets, if you will. I think the formal term is money laundering. And I wonder whether any of you could shed some insight into the relationships that Russian oligarchs have to the U.S. business world and the feasibility of something like that even happening. So I think I would not be surprised if the Russia investigation resulted in uh, money laundering charges or corruption charges, and if we discovered that Donald Trump's real estate empire in New York and Florida, such as it was, was a laundromat for Russian, dirty Russian money, dirty Chinese money, dirty Gulf money, etc. If If you're uh, in the Russian elite, most likely you have gotten your money through illegitimate and illegal ways, most likely, <laughs> uh, for any lawyers present. Um, and if you have gotten the money that way, that means somebody else can get it from you in that same way. That means you have to get the money out. And the, what's the best way to get your money out is to park it in real estate. This is why half of London is owned by the Russians, half of Geneva is owned by the Russians, a lot of New York, a lot of Miami is owned by the Russians who don't actually live there. It is just a way to get their money away from other people who can steal it from them the way they stole it. Yeah. Um, you know, real estate is a very good way of laundering money. I suppose we do have that statement by, I forget whether it was Eric or Donald, that there's Russian money in the Trump organization. We also know that the New York Bank stopped lending to him, to Trump, a while back because he didn't have such a great reputation as, as a customer. The main thing I would say is, look, is there any of this where you'd say, I, no, I just refuse to believe that Donald Trump would be party to something like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> and with that, it is time for us to turn to our always closing segment of Radio Atlantic, Keepers. What have you heard, read, watched, seen, experienced recently that you would like to not forget? Jeff, let's start with you. What would you like to keep? So... Um, uh, over uh, uh, spring break, uh, I took uh, two of our daughters to Ukraine because that's the way we roll. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> second prize, you can't even imagine, right? Um, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted them to see a bunch of different things in in Ukraine, Maidan, and Kiev, and understand what was going on there. And then we. We drove down and did a bunch of other things and got to Odessa. And I told them that I wanted them to go to Odessa because it's a great center of Jewish literature, Russian literature, Isaac Babel, and all the rest. But actually, it's, uh, uh, this, this is brought to my mind by the fact that we were, gonna pre we were preparing to do this topic. Um, there's a, a restaurant in, in Odessa uh, called Dacha, which is in a dacha, actually. Um, and it serves the best potato pancakes that I've ever had. And I, we drove from Kiev to Odessa just to get latkes. And, um, <laughs> and, and thinking about Russia today just got me thinking about um, how I would love to go back to Odessa to get more latkes. That's really, that's it. That's it. Sorry. That's all I got. Unforgettable potato pancakes. <laughs> Elliot? I'm really glad you said that, because I, I was afraid that what I'm about to say might sound silly. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you know, you haven't so, eaten these latkes. So, okay, so just, just trust me. All right. Um, so this is actually an experience I had last night, and it really, I want to hold on to this feeling. I, I was able to get into pigeon pose for five full yoga breaths, and, and I got to my feet under my own power, and I still had sensation in my right leg. And, and that may not mean much to you, young man, but, but when you get to my age, it's a big deal. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Elliot Cohen, esteemed author and yogi. Julia. And magician. And magician, by the way. Slash magic connoisseur. Right. 
because this is a Russia panel, I'm just going to bring it down many notches to, you know, a really dark place. Um, I actually happened to turn on the TV this afternoon and saw Otto Warmbier's parents on CNN mm -hmm. uh, talking about the experience of welcoming their son home from North Korea and not being prepared to see the condition he was in. Mm -hmm. You know, they said he had his sh head shaved, a giant scar covering the top of one of his feet. Uh, his father said that he it looked like somebody took a pair of pliers and rearranged his bottom teeth, he, and that he was jerking around and like mm. making these crazy howling sounds. And it just struck me as, um, by the time we discover a, a, a thing like that, that kind of texture of what actually happened when history ran over a small person, um, this, the, the spotlight has generally moved on and we don't think about how these grand world historical events affect small people on the ground. And it really reminded me of um, probably the best book I've read in the last decade, which is um, Svetlana Alexievich's Secondhand Time, uh, about what it was like to go through the Soviet collapse and what it left in its wake. Uh, we just think, oh, it happened in 1991, you know, down came one flag, up went another. And she just goes through and interviews people who just share the very kind of fine texture of their lives and what, it, what history feels like on the ground uh, on a very personal level. Mm. Man. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's the full range of human potato-based and yoga-based oh, emotion <laughs> here. It's you fine. Know. One day, uh, Vladimir Putin will not no longer be the leader of Russia. He'll be the leader of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and the question of who will next lead Russia will be upon us all. I mean, many people are asking about this now, and I'm, I'm curious if any of you on stage, or if any of you in the audience have heard of the rule of Bald Harry. Bald Harry? Anyone? Yes. Got a couple takers over here. So, Bald Harry is a pattern in Russian rulers that goes back if you believe them, it's all the way to 1825. The legend goes that a balding Russian ruler will always be succeeded by one with a healthy pate of hair, and vice versa. So, Lenin, bald. Stalin, hairy. Khrushchev, bald. Brezhnev, hairy. Andropov, balding. Chernenko, luscious locks. Gorbachev, shiny. Yeltsin, immaculately quaffed. Putin, Balding, Medvedev, Harry, Putin, even balder. <laughs> if you want to know who's coming next, the clue is in the coiffure. You heard it here first. <laughs> Bald hair. Thank you, Matt. Don't forget. <laughs> and that'll do it for this live taping of Radio Atlantic. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you all. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you to the terrific crew at the historic Six and I Synagogue for making this a wonderful experience for us. Thank you to our producer, Kevin Townsend, and to Katie Lau. And to Katie Green and Kim Lau, who also make Radio Atlantic possible. To Anna Bross and Sydney Simon for all their help putting this together. And as always, thanks to everyone listening at home. Have a wonderful evening. If you're here for the Washington Ideas Festival, enjoy the rest of the week. And we'll see you on the podcast.